Many of you have taken me up on my invitation uh, to ask you to send me uh, your desires in terms of the subjects of the words of Jesus that are difficult. And by far, the vast majority of you who have sent those notes have asked specifically about what did Jesus mean when he said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. And uh, I looked at that and I said, this is what you call stomp the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will attempt to do that today. So I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 34. Matthew 10, 34. We normally kind of get into the message, into the text after an introduction, but there really is not much of an introduction <laughs> with a text like that. It's very clear. But I want to explain to you, and we spend a little time looking at this text and what did Jesus really mean <clears throat> by those words. Let me invite you to stand up with me as we read the Word of God together. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 10, verses 34, 35, and 36. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, as if they need any help. <laughs> a man's enemy will be the members of his household. Not so long ago, two things happened that kind of crystallized some of my thinking here. A young man was telling me about a ministry with which he became associated, and one of the first things they said to him when he joined the ministry said, do not say that you're a Christian. Reason. The word Christianity is misunderstood by a lot of people. Sometimes Christianity has a negative connotation to a whole lot of people. So they said to him, you can say that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ if you're asked. And even so, when you offer Jesus, just offer him as a friend, period. Within a matter of weeks, a friend of mine was telling me about a memo that was issued by a pastor in a very large evangelical church. And it said to the staff, here are the don'ts, the words that you should not mention, the terminologies, the, the, you know, we, I know I'm aware of the, the difficulty that we Christians kind of use Christianese and people from outside do not really understand. We almost like speak a different language. So it is understandable when that memo came to the staff and they said to them, you do not use the word born again or saved from sin or hell or damnation or eternal judgment and eternal punishment. Just do not use these words at all. But I want to share with you on a personal level. This is on a personal level now, not on a pastoral level, but on a personal level the anguish that I personally have felt, my personal observation, understanding all that I understand and knowing all that I know and have experienced in the first 19 years of my life. And I'm not even asking you to experience what I'm experiencing or feel what I feel. But this is a phenomenon that seemed to be going across the board in our nation. And I'm merely telling you of my own inner anguish at the condition in which I find ourselves as a culture. And it's not surprising, therefore, it's not astonishing to me that before Jesus goes to verse 34 to talk about he did not come to bring peace but a sword, he begins in verse 32 by saying, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whosoever disowns me before man, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. You see, before Jesus can talk about peace, he had to talk about acknowledging him before men. What does it mean to acknowledge Jesus before men? I want you to listen carefully, please. It is far more than just to say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. It is more than claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ, particularly if it is beneficial to my business and business dealings. 
It is far more to just recognize some truth about Christianity and about Christ and subscribe to those truths. It is far more than that. To acknowledge Jesus publicly means that I am not embarrassed to confess that Jesus Christ means everything to me. To acknowledge Jesus Christ publicly means that He is my only Lord and Savior. Even at the risk of ridicule, even at the risk of financial loss, and yes, even at the risk of physical injury. Does that mean that if a believer has lapsed in his or her faithfulness and at some point denied their faith, that God will not forgive them? Is it the unforgivable sin? Absolutely not. Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times, and when he repented, the Lord Jesus Christ not only forgave him, but he restored him. Timothy was a great leader in the church, and apparently he became politically correct, and he was trying to kind of please different groups in the church. And apparently he became reluctant about openly and boldly proclaim the gospel out of fear. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes to him and says, 2 Timothy 1.8, So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. But beloved, I want to tell you there is a world of difference between lapsing and continuously being embarrassed about the Lord Jesus. It is a world of difference because God always forgives lapsers. God always is ready to restore lapsers. God is always more than ready to in, engulf us into His arms when we repent and turn to Him. And that is why Jesus warns us. He said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword on the earth. Isn't that a contradiction? Not at all, my friend. But I can understand. Many times I try to put myself in the place of somebody who really does not believe. I try to put myself in somebody who's reading the Bible and really has not understood what the gospel is all about and begin to read these things. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. If I was not a committed disciple of Jesus Christ, I would say, wait a minute, I don't want this. Wouldn't you? I mean, it, it does, I mean, if I did not acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Savior of my soul and the Lord of my life, and I would, if I've heard these words just spoken or read in the Bible, I wouldn't want to be a Christian. I mean, my attitude would be, man, the world is full of swords. I'm looking for peace. I would say, the world is full of hatred and anger. I'm looking for peace in my life and in my family. The, the, to, to so many people, that they are weary and they're stressed out, and they're looking for that inner peace. Just about everyone I know wants that peace that doesn't make sense to the world. So once again, if that is the case, what does Jesus mean by saying, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. You see, if you take the words of Jesus in this verse at face value, you have to conclude that this is the worst marketing endeavor of all times. <laughs> I mean, surely, this is not, I mean, this is not a good salesman here. I mean, Jesus couldn't be very very good motivational speaker. <laughs> Surely, he's not winning friends and influencing people by saying those words. But of course, these words have nothing to do with the inner peace that only Jesus Christ can give you and give me. They have nothing to do with that inner peace that is only possible when you come in surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with that inner peace. It's far from contradiction. I'm going to show you in a minute that far from the Bible being contradictory, it is consistent. If you take those words at face value, 
you'll have trouble. But then you have to understand how Semitic people talk. <laughs> you have to understand how a Semitic language is framed and how that language, because it really that's where a lot of people get off on the wrong track when they do not understand how it's this put together, how the language of the day, how the language of the time, and how the culture in which the Bible is born. You've got to understand it. Jesus was speaking to his disciples who have already experienced that inner peace that he gave them. Jesus was speaking to the disciples who never knew an inner peace, a peace of knowing that they are forgiven and they are on their way to heaven until they met Jesus. You've got to understand, he's talking to them. And therefore, they understood that he was not speaking about that inner peace that only Jesus could give. He was talking about another type of peace, an outward peace. I'm going to come and explain it in a minute. Jesus was preparing them to understand that the very gospel of peace that they have received that brought them in a peace is going to be rejected by others. Jesus was preparing them that the very gospel of peace that reconciled us sinners to a holy God, only Jesus Christ can do that. They understood that this is the peace that Jesus gives they understood that he was not talking about this. He, they understood that the very gospel of peace that they have accepted, that they have received, is going to be rejected by others. And those who reject the gospel of peace will also reject the proclaimers of that peace. They will reject the proclaimers of that gospel. And that very act of rejection of the gospel of peace by some will bring conflict and disharmony between them and those who have accepted it. You see, it's the outward peace, not the inner peace. But you know what? This especially, especially going to be felt if those who have rejected the peace of God are the nearest and the dearest to us. And that's what Jesus is warning them about. I'm going to give you a personal testimony, a personal example of what I mean. In 1997, I was invited in Washington, D.C. by a very large conser politically conservative group, organization, very prominent. They invited me to come and give the invocation. I was, not, I was a little bit concerned if they really knew me well enough to ask me to do something dangerous like that. 